Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm Lydia Kavraki, and I'm a professor of computer science at Rice University in Houston, Texas. I will be coordinating this next session on artificial intelligence and computing um, together with Professor Theodora Varvarigu, who is with the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Joseph Sifakis. We'll start with the keynote and we'll proceed with the, panels, uh, the panel as the other sessions did. Dr. Joseph Sifakis, Yosif Sifakis, is Emeritus Research Director of Verimac at Grenoble, France. Verimac is a leading research center in the area of embedded and safety critical systems and is affiliated with the National Center for Scientific Research of France, the University of Grenoble, uh, Grenoble Apples, uh, Alpes, uh, and the Grenoble Institute of Technology. Uh, Dr. Sifakis is the founder of Verimac and served as its director for 13 years. He was a full professor at the Col Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne for the period of 2011 to 2016. Dr. Sifakis is a leading figure in the fields of model checking and embedded systems. His recent research focuses on rigorous component-based design and the design of trustworthy autonomous systems, self-driving cars in particular. Dr. Sifakis' work over the years is characterized by an unusual recurrent pattern. The problem is first studied from an abstract foundational point of view, which leads to methods and techniques for its solution, which in turn leads to an effective implementation that is successfully used in multiple industrial applications. In 2007, Dr. Sifakis received the Turing Award for his contributions to the theory and application of model checking, uh, the most widely used system verification technique. The Turing Award is the highest uh, distinction in computer science and it's colloquially known uh, and often referred to as the Nobel Prize of Computing. In his career, he has received numerous distinctions. I'm just going to say that he's the member of six uh, different academies. Uh, he served Greece, he has served Greece in multiple capacities, including being president of the Greek Council for Research and Technology from 2014 to 2016. We are honored that Dr. Sifakis has agreed to discuss his view on the topic of computing and artificial intelligence, the topic of our session, and we will follow with a discussion on how this topic is being shaped in the, green, in the Greek landscape. Dr. Sifakis. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to give this talk about computing and artificial intelligence. I will say nothing specific about Greece. Uh, hopefully, we will have some discussion about that in the panel. Uh, I would like to start by saying that computing and AI evolved in parallel, uh, and uh, they have undergone the transformations. Computing was driven by technological conversions with different application areas, and you see here a list. And uh, AI has studied systems that mimic uh, human cognitive abilities. Initially, it focused more on symbolic approaches. And then uh, uh, connectionism uh, prevailed. And you see a list of sub-areas of uh, AI. But today, when we talk about AI, we mean mainly neural networks and machine learning. Uh, I would like also to emphasize that there is currently a lot of confusion about how the intelligence is, uh, how it is achieved. And of course, the spectacular rise of uh, intelligence is uh, uh, fueled by some over optimism uh, by the media, large technology companies that uh, uh, suggest that uh, uh, human level AI is only a matter of time. Uh, we know also this mythology that has been developed around ultra intelligence, and some believe that. Uh, machine learning and its uh, developments will enable us to meet uh, the intelligence uh, challenge. Of course, this is not my opinion. I think that despite all the spectacular achievements due to neural networks today, we have only weak uh, AI. This gives uh, the building blocks for building smart systems, but a lot needs to be done to be able to, to, to build intelligent systems uh, like we build bridges and buildings, if uh, ever this will be possible. I don't know. I doubt. But a big step toward uh, general AI is uh, to develop autonomous systems that are systems capable of replacing human agents that work in complex organization. And this is uh, uh, something very central in the vision of uh, the IoT. And uh, 
of course, this is what I'm going to explain. Building trustworthy autonomous systems requires the convergence between uh, conventional computing and AI because we have to integrate database techniques and model-based systems engineering. So this is an outline of my talk, and without delay, I will uh, start talking about comparing human and machine intelligence. So probably you know that uh, this is uh, a problem that Alan Turing has addressed with his uh, famous uh, test. So how uh, uh, goes the Turing test? Uh, you have a computer A and a human B in a room and an experimenter that sends questions that are written questions and receives back uh, answers. And uh, Turing says that if C cannot tell us which is the computer and which is the person, then of course uh, the machine is uh, as intelligent as the person. And uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because uh, we hear quite often claims that a system uh, just passed the, the Turing test, okay? And they say, hallelujah, this is a great achievement. I, I think that this is technical nonsense. Anyway, the, the Turing test is not uh, appropriate enough uh, to compare uh, human and machine intelligence because success uh, depends on human judgment, is purely subjective. And of course, you can have a lot of bias by choosing the set of, of test cases. And also another argument is uh, that uh, test cannot be uh, a question-answer game only because uh, human intelligence is m much more than a conversation, is uh, an interaction with the environment, speech, movement, social behavior. So instead, in some paper, uh, we propose another kind of test uh, I believe is more useful uh, to, compare, uh, to compare human and machine intelligence. I will say that a machine is as intelligent as a human performing a task in a system if I can replace uh, the human by uh, the machine in a seamless manner. So, for instance, I can say this machine is as intelligent as a driver if I can put the machine in the place of the driver and, and I have the, the overall, I mean, the same, the same behavior. And of course, for this kind of test, success can be based only on technical criteria and also uh, and this is the problem, I think, for some people, this requires not only computational intelligence, because in order to, be su be to build such a system that replaces humans, uh, uh, we should also implement uh, sensory motor functions. Uh, this is a very, a, very, a very important problem. Now, another way to compare uh, human and machine intelligence is uh, to uh, uh, think about the, how we produce and develop and apply knowledge. So a very well-known fact is that uh, our mind uh, combines two types of thinking, fast thinking and slow thinking. Here I'm using Kahneman's uh, technology for the famous book. And uh, fast thinking is non-conscious, automatic. This is a kind of thinking we use when we walk, we speak. We don't understand how it works, but it works. And uh, slow thinking is uh, the source of, of any reason knowledge. Now, uh, it is... Uh, uh, important to emphasize that there is a very interesting analogy between the two types of thinking and the two types of computers we have today. We have conventional computers that we program by using algorithms, and this is model-based knowledge, and we use, uh, on the other hand, uh, neural networks. These are uh, circuits that we train uh, to distinguish, say, cats from dogs, exactly as children do. But uh, the problem with these systems is that they, they cannot be verified. So they produce a type of knowledge that is different from scientific and technical knowledge. And uh, here I would like to explain that as uh, engineers, we deal with different types of knowledge. And it's important to understand the differences. Uh, this is illustrated uh, by this pyramid here. So the blue area is non-empirical knowledge knowledge that you produce by reasoning. And below you have empirical knowledge, knowledge about the external world. Uh, you have very simple knowledge like events and conditions, the temperature today is 35 degrees. And then you have common empirical knowledge like system one knowledge that is data-based. This allows prediction. But there is a big difference between this type of knowledge and I include machine learning there and data analytics knowledge with, uh, with scientific and technical knowledge. Why? Because uh, for scientific and technical knowledge, we require explainability using mathematical models. Remember when Newton developed his, uh, proposed his laws, he developed also a differential calculus to, to justify, to, to, explain, to explain his theory, to explain his law. Okay, so 
uh, here, I, I, in this slide, I, I, I would like to illustrate the difference between the type of knowledge generated by neural nets and, and uh, scientific knowledge. So this is a standard experiment of Galileo. So that's some experiment. And through generalization and abstraction, he guesses that this is the model that describes the relationship between force and uh, acceleration. Now, if I want to train a neural network to distinguish between images of cats and dogs, I take uh, uh, images, I have an experimenter, a human experimenter, and they will label the images, and you will train the network. But of course, now the important question is how you can characterize this input-output relation of the neural network, and this is the issue of explainability that is a very, very important issue in, in AI. Okay, so uh, just a, a more pragmatic argument regarding the, 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 the uh, comparison between hu human and machine intelligence. Uh, probably you've seen uh, information of this kind. An autopilot mistakes the moon for the yellow traffic light, for instance. Okay, And uh, uh, this uh, can happen to neural networks, but it, this will never happen to humans. Why? because humans contextualize the sensory information and understand that the traffic light cannot be in the sky. And the reason for this is that the human mind is equipped with a semantic model of the external world, and uh, we don't understand how this uh, semantic model is built, but this is the, 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 the model we use to interpret sensory information and natural language. And human understanding, in fact, goes bottom up from sensor level to semantic level and top down from reasoning uh, from a semantic model to perception. Just to give you another example, if uh, you see uh, this photo here, you'll say, oh, this is a stop sign. And uh, perhaps you've never seen a stop sign covered by snow, but you know what is snow and what is a, a stop sign. And of course, if you want to, to train neural networks to recognize this situation, you should train neural networks for all the variety of weather conditions. And this is another example. This shows a sequence of images. If you, you see it, uh, uh, you say, oh, this is uh, probably an aircraft accident. And this is something very, very uh, hard to infer by neural networks. Why? Neural networks can analyze an image, but cannot uh, uh, find the causal relationship. They need some, some model of the external world. So to summarize, uh, uh, humans are much superior in situation awareness than machines. And the challenge here, I think this is the big challenge of AI today, is how to combine learning and reasoning, how to build a semantic model of the external world and be, be able to interpret the world. Okay, I'll stop here. Now, let me talk about autonomous systems. Uh, why autonomous systems are important? Because, in my opinion, this is the result of the convergence between computing and AI, and this is an important ste step toward, uh, to, to, toward the general AI. And uh, I, I take as an example self-driving cars, because this is an example easy to understand. So here I'm showing uh, uh, the behavior of an agent that controls a, a car. So the external environment, you see here, the environment is, is like that. This is an electromechanical system. And you have sensors and actuators. It's, it's obvious how it works. And of course, you need uh, some module for situation awareness, understanding what happens, and for decision making. Situation awareness means that I perceive, uh, I can analyze what the sensor information I perceive. I, I find obstacles, I know their kinetic state, I build a, a model of the external world, and based on this model, I will uh, see which goals are applicable, and I will pick up a set of applicable goals, and I will generate uh, a corresponding plans. Okay, so these, these are standard ideas that come also from robotics, I think. And another idea is to have here this model of self-learning, uh, to, be, to be able to learn from what we observe here and create some knowledge that will allow us to increase predictability and also to make uh, better decisions. I have no time to discuss this. All I would like to emphasize is that we don't know how to build these systems today. And uh, because there are problems, complexity problems, complexity of perception, this is well understood, complexity of uncertainty because we cannot predict the behavior of the environment. Complexity of decision, because you deal with many different types of goals, 
And the goals have different time constants, in fact. It's a very complex problem, and for each uh, plan, okay, I mean, the complexity also for plan generation is, is maybe huge. But what I would like to emphasize is that in addition to autonomic complexity, in order to build autonomous systems, you have to solve some very hard uh, systems engineering problem. I have a concept called system complexity. It's the product of component complexity and architectural compl complexity. Uh, my point of view is that to build uh, autonomous systems, you these are the hardest syst uh, systems to, to, that you can imagine because components are cyber physical systems and architectures involve time, space, organization, dynamism, uh, organizational dynamism. Now, something that is else that is very important that is not very important for intelligent systems like language translators or personal assistants is that uh, you should guarantee their safety, their trustworthiness. So for small critical systems, we have theory, we have uh, uh, standards about how to do that and methods. I will not explain this in full detail. What I would like to show is that we follow uh, design flows uh, with predefined steps and at each step we use models to justify our decisions. And based on this analysis we make of our, of our design flow, you can say, for instance, then uh, that the flight controller has no more than 10 to the minus nine failures per uh, uh, hour of flight. And uh, this does not work for obvious reasons. And uh, this explains also the fact that some big companies like uh, Google, uh, Nvidia, uh, develop solutions for autonomous, uh, for self-driving cars based exclusively on neural networks. So, so they bypass all this, they forget about that. So what's the situation today? We know how to build, uh, apply the classical conventional approach to, to build the components that are reliable. And then on the other hand, you have these companies that come with self-driving platforms. So the self-driving platform here is a huge neural network that receives frames. It's trained by simulation and generates a steering angle and a braking and, and acceleration, deceleration signals. Of course, you can, you can buy such a platform, but of course, nobody believes that it is reliable enough. And additionally, you have all the problem of the integration in, in an electromechanical system. So I think that in my opinion, we should strive to define design flows that are, I call, hybrid. So the idea would be to try to mix components that uh, use neural networks and other uh, model-based components. And of course, this is not an easy problem. I don't know how to, to deal with that, but I think this is the way to go. And uh, if you have questions, I can, okay. Now, last slides about the future. Uh, so, the impact of intelligent systems. Uh, I said that we uh, should break with the traditional techniques and still uh, have uh, guarantees of transworthiness. Design cannot be entirely model-based and uh, also design correctness cannot be achieved at design time. So if we want to design a system today, it is, uh, uh, it is checked and then it's closed. You cannot modify, if it's a critical system, you cannot modify a line of code. And you know that for Tesla cars, for instance, you have, you have updates of software, of critical software of, of, over the air. So uh, this is a problem. I don't know, but I think this is an important trend you should take into account. I talked already about hybrid design and also Something very important that, that uh, in, in, in new systems engineering practice would be that we should find a global system validation techniques. And uh, okay, so uh, probably also you've seen that some companies uh, say that we've driven so many billions of miles and our systems are, 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 are safe. And this is not a, a technically valid argument just because we don't know how the simulated miles are related to real miles. You need some theory about that. I don't have time to discuss. So to finish about autonomous systems, there is a big gap between automated and autonomous systems. And it, we will need some time to, if we ever re can reach a full automation. Uh, something else I would like to uh, discuss concluding is that intelligent systems 
could help us overcome some limitations we have in the development of, of knowledge. Uh, you know that human mind is limited by what we call cognitive complexity. All the scientific theories we have uh, involve a small number of independent uh, variables, elements, etc. And often we study complex phenomena like economic phenomena by doing some simplification. This is a very well known phenomenon in economy. They don't model the human factor just uh, because they, they cannot, they don't know how to do. So I think that by using supercomputers and AI, we can build what I call neural oracles. So uh, neural networks with millions of parameters that we can try to predict to predict some complex phenomena. I know, for instance, a, a project uh, that is also supported by Google for uh, uh, predicting earthquakes. Predicting earthquakes, that I think that with little science and many data, perhaps they can do better than, than, than the theoreticians. We will see. Uh, of course, uh, using such kind of science uh, will pose some problems. And in particular, we understand that uh, uh, knowledge production is not a privilege of humans. And of course, the question is the division of work between uh, machines and uh, humans in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this process. Finally, and this is the last slide, uh, I would like to say that our progress in building autonomous systems will ultimately depend on our ability to deepen the mind-brain relationship. And uh, I think, I know that uh, some uh, people say mind is not important or mind does not exist. You know, the philosophical debates around the, 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 the body-mind problem. I think, I don't care if mind exists or not. Mental phenomena are very important to understand the human behavior, just as software is very important to understand what your computer does. So. I hope that in the future we'll have more projects that will focus not only on the study of the circuits of the brain, but in the, on the relationship between the brain and the mental, mental system of, of, of humans. And I know that projects that have promised a lot about, say, investigating, uh, unraveling uh, uh, consciousness and things like that, and they did not give anything concrete. And finally, I have written text about that, so I would like to finish with that. I think that uh, we should invest more money to create interdisciplinary pro uh, projects to explore what I call the Big Bang of Consciousness. As we explore the Big Bang of Cosmology, why the Big Bang of Cosmology is uh, more important than the Big Bang of Consciousness? I think. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this can be discussed, I, I think that, that uh, and here I, I have a list of questions, so I think I'll stop here. And uh, if we understand how intelligence and uh, consciousness have uh, evolved and have been created during evolution, this, uh, this will be something very, very important also for humanity. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.